everybody. Welcome to Horror 101 at Dark Carnival. Thank you for coming to Hamilton to our show. Uh, I'm Monica S. Kubler, Managing Editor of Rumorg Magazine, and this afternoon we are going to be discussing everything you need to know to break into horror writing, and that's whether that be horror journalism, horror fiction, children's or YA horror fiction. We've got a panel, we've got a panel, a very diverse panel who have done a little bit of everything. So what I'm going to begin with is I'm going to get our panel to introduce themselves, and I'm going to ask them to speak a little bit about what part of horror writing they work in, and a little bit about what of theirs you might find out in the world as far as bookstores or in magazines, just so you can get an idea of who we have here. So later when I open up the floor to questions, if there's someone in particular that you want to pick their brain, you'll know exactly who the right person is to do that to. So we're going to start at the end with Claire Horson. Hi, um, my name's Claire Horson. Um, I, I grew up in the UK. I moved to Canada almost 16 years ago, which uh, um, is, is just stop everyone um, wondering for the first five minutes if I'm Australian. Um, my, uh, <laughs> I feel like I have to explain that. Um, I've been writing for Room Org since 2007, um, on and off, and now uh, these days I'm writing more horror fiction, and I self-published my first horror novel in 2014, and it's available on Amazon. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Jeff Spearglass. I also write for Rue Morgue Magazine. Um, I teach grade two, so I'm on summer break, and I'm very excited to be on summer break right now. Um, I've been writing for young people for probably just over 10 years. I used to work at Chirp, Chickadee, and Owl magazines. Um, so naturally, I now write for Rumor magazine. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it, because I work with grade two students, I write books like for young emerging readers called like X Marks the Spot. Um, but I've also written for Scholastics, Educational Wing, and Nelson. Um, and I, for a while, was putting out sort of owl books as weirdest sort of nonfiction, like Fear of This Book and. Gross Universe, both on sale later, uh, but I've broken into uh, my favorite thing, which is writing scary stories. So the big picture down there is uh, a book I put up a couple years ago called Evil Eye. I have one coming out in the fall. Uh, I have twin four-year-olds, so I'm really busy. I'm going to have passed away. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sephora Jerome, and uh, right now I'm the Ontario chapter uh, head of the Horror Writers Association. And I also am a horror author. I had uh, four books with Leisure Books back in the day. I have three novellas with Sam Hain Publishing right now. And currently I am writing the Witch Upon a Star series, which is an erotic horror astrology uh, series. And each uh, month tackles a different zodiac sign along with a specific, it's a coven of witches. Each witch is a different sign of the zodiac. And then each month we get a different love spell with a lot of hot sex and hot witches doing hot things. And I'm also an actress. I'm in um, uh, Slime City Massacre and Killer Rack um, and a couple of other things. And I'll be launching a new YouTube channel in a couple of weeks with some other dudes where we're doing little horror short films and uh, reviewing movies and such. And I also do weekly tarot scopes on my own personal YouTube channel, which are always free. And sometimes they're not always weekly, but they're there. And I do each sign individually. So just uh, join, subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's, it's just Sephora. And get your weekly horoscopes. Hi folks, uh, I'm Stephen B. Pearl, the B is so that you can find me easily on the internet. <laughs> um, I write mostly paranormal as opposed to what you'd strictly interpret as horror. Um, Nuki Kubai being, ex being an example. And I also write science fiction, so I'm sort of a cross genre. But uh, yeah, there you have it. <laughs> Uh, I gave you the brief introduction of me, which is managing editor of Rumorg Magazine. Uh, I've also worked in the world of horror fiction for many years. I ran the Micropress Burning Effigy uh, for 15 years before I had my daughter and needed more time. And uh, I, cur I currently also uh, serialize a YA vampire series online, so if you have any questions about serial fiction or writing online, uh, you can pick my brain later. Hi, I'm Suzanne Church. I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Currently, I'm working on a trilogy in uh, the Ed Greenwood Group's brand new uh, publishing venture called The Helma Series. So it's about uh, demons living on Earth and you are the food. And my trilogy takes place in Toronto. It reads like a Patterson book, but with demons. 
Hey y'all, uh, my name is April Snellings and you might be surprised to hear that I'm not Canadian. Uh, I live in Tennessee and I work for Remorque Magazine. I write radio plays for Glass Eye Picks, which is a company that did um, Stakeland and House of the Devil. We have a radio series called Tales from Beyond the Pale and uh, that's, that's where I'm playing a lot now. Okay, I'm going to begin this with a couple questions that I really enjoy tossing out of these sorts of panels. And the first one is going to be, what's the one piece of advice that you really wish someone had given you when you were first starting out that you'd like to give to someone now? The thing that I've learned is, is not to put too much stake in, in saying, like not to, to put my stuff out there and, and imagine that like, I'm like, okay, this is it, I've made it, you know, this is, success cannot be, Far behind. I know this sounds really depressing and stuff, but there's, I've really learned to appreciate um, the feeling that you get from just having finished something and putting something out there. Um, but I, what I find that the reward with writing is, is not so much, I, it, it's a great feeling when you publish something and people read it and people tell you that they like it. Um, it that is an amazing feeling. Um, but I think that the real reward comes from the, the satisfaction. You know, if you look too much to, um, to, to, um, external validation. Um, it, it's always amazing, um, but the, the real thing you have to focus on is that you, you've done it for yourself, you've achieved this thing, and, and that is yours, and whatever happens, whatever anyone says, that's you, you have that. I kind of agree with what you were saying, um, in a big way. Um, you know, the work is its own reward. Um, I feel like, and I feel like the one career that's actually established for me is my teaching career, and my writing career, kind of peaks and troughs all the time. Um, but going with your guts and your instincts, and my instincts often take me to places that are not commercially viable for young readers. Um, like I wrote a book called Barf Beard, which, you know, I, I remember an editor I gave it to said, it's called Barf Beard, we can't do it. I said, oh, that's too bad, because I think it'd be a great book. Another editor that felt the same way, I would love to do this book, but our pub board will say no. Um, but if you throw enough things against the wall and you follow your instincts, something sticks. Eventually something sticks. And I find I really try to relish inspiration when it hits and know that, and, and, you know, because no one's telling you what's good or bad, just being able to follow your guts and all the way through, something will eventually come of that uh, in some form. And it may not be the form you originally intended it to. Um, I didn't think I was going to do nonfiction for kids. But there was an opportunity, and it turned out to be a really good one. So uh, things are out there. Yeah, that's a tough question. Can you ask it again? <laughs> this... What was the one? Uh, what's the one piece of advice you wish someone had given to you right at the beginning of your writing career? That's hard because, like, I took creative writing, so I got all sorts of advice, and a lot of it not good. Um, <laughs> and I have to say, like. You know, uh, both uh, what, what they've said is absolutely true. Trust your gut, trust yourself, and yeah, don't. I remember I wrote a letter to Clyde Barker once asking for his advice, and his advice was don't trust agents. So I have listened to that. <laughs> um, yeah, so you trust your gut, like seriously. Uh, right, life is so short. I always thought I had forever to write, and now all of a sudden I'm in my 50s, and it's like I have all these series I still am trying to do that I started in my 20s. So the thing is, write what you want to write, write what you love, and if you write what you love, everything should follow. Mine would be uh, embrace criticism. I went through a lot of years where I was stuck in the it's my baby and you can't touch it stage. I greatly regret those years because they were wasted. Nobody gets anywhere without exterior criticism that says, this is where you're screwing up, this is how you fix it, and get over yourself. Mine's really funny because I just, I just got this piece of advice. I've struggled, uh, I write novels and I uh, don't have much problem with that. I'm really good at writing. There's a joke about me, it's like I think up a novel and it becomes a trilogy. <laughs> I, I haven't been able to, I, I've been struggling with short stories my entire adult life. Yeah. So uh, I actually just got the best piece, piece of advice, which I wish someone had said to me 20 years ago at StokerCon a couple months ago, and it was, it was about short story writing, and it was simply this, write the ending first. And it's changed my life. Well, I'm going to be really pragmatic and practical. So two things. One... Make sure you pay for your domain name early so someone else doesn't own your domain name before you start writing a whole bunch of books under it and then realize that you can't have that as your website because someone else owns it. And secondly, think very carefully about what you want to be called on Twitter before you create your Twitter handle because 
you know, if, if you've ever listened to the Foo Fighters talk about their band name, they talk about how if there's one thing they could change, if they go, go back and change, it's that they think they have the stupidest name ever for a band. So you don't want to be that person that has to tell that story a thousand times of I can't believe this is the name of my Twitter handle. So yes, think carefully about that and pay for that domain name early. Even if you don't have the money for a website, pay for the domain name and know that you'll have it when you need it. You know, just start now. Um, I wish that somebody could have gotten that through to me earlier. Just to start now. Start small if you have to. It's okay to, you know, everybody wants to see their name on a book or on a script. But you know what? It's pretty cool to see your name in your local newspaper. I mean, and, and those, are, those are attainable goals. You can start writing. Most of you can probably get published next month somehow, you know. Just start doing it. Um, Eight years ago, I was interviewing 12-year-olds about ice skating competitions, you know, and now I get to write monologues for Parker Crampton, and that's super cool. So just start really, really small. It's okay. Ditch your ego. Work your way up from there. Just build slowly. Okay, so the second question for the group is, I know being out there in the audience and sitting in front of a bunch of established writers can be a little daunting because, you know, sometimes people have 20 novels or whatever, or, you know, produced radio plays under their belt. It's a bit intimidating. So. We're all human though, so I'm going to toss out in a we're all human question, and uh, it is this. What is the worst mistake you've made during your writing career? As a writer or as, as a human? <laughs> <laughs> as a writer? As a writer or as a human, really? <laughs> because I think the other thing is, you know what? We've all made mistakes, so, and, and all of you, as you embark in your writing careers, will make mistakes. And I think it's important to learn from those mistakes and to learn from each other. So that's why I'm going to throw this one across the table. Yeah. Let's start at this end. No, no. I'm going to throw the pressure off Claire for a moment. Carefully research the people that you're going to be working for. And if you hear really bad things from a lot of people, listen to them. Uh, be very careful. Once, once that relationship has started, it's very difficult to end it. And uh, the internet makes everything permanent. So be very mindful about who you work with. Uh, you know, curate your relationships very, very carefully. I learned that the hard way. I got involved with some, uh, this is a long time ago, and it was very difficult to sever ties with a publisher that I wish I hadn't been involved with. So uh, yeah, man, don't, don't just go for the opportunity. Look at what's behind it. Yeah, and I'm going to add to that a little bit. There's a website uh, called Predators and Editors uh, that you can go and you can research any agent or any editor or any publisher to decide whether or not you want, before you go ahead and sign that paperwork that says, yeah, sure, I'll publish a book with you. Because there's something really gratifying about this notion that someone's going to publish one of your books. And you're so keen, and you might even notice that that particular publisher is on Predators and Editors and editors as a please don't publish here and you think well how bad can it be and then you sign the papers and you put out the book and you realize okay now I get it now I know why they're on predators and editors so go to that site and check out who you work with before you sign any papers because you never know if you're going to end up with a relationship where even if your contract says you know we promise to do X doesn't necessarily mean that's actually going to happen before I give mine I'm going to jump in on that though even better, if you're, if you're really serious about a publisher, ask, reach out to a couple of authors they've published. Absolutely. Because I'm going to tell you a story. There's a thread on Predators and Editors where there's a person that I don't even know who is accusing my press of not paying. And a whole bunch of people jumped on this. And we paid. We always paid. And a couple of my authors eventually came in and defended. But it's one of those things. It's like sometimes someone can just get a knit in their, in their bum about you and they can decide to go online and they can decide to, you know, spread some untruths and probably the only thread in the history of the internet where I lost my temper and I'm once again not proud of that, so maybe don't lose your temper in threads <laughs> on uh, so predators and editors, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's a tough one because I mean I took that very personally when they suggested that I wasn't paying my talent because that's something that... Um, Anyone who knows me knows that I take it very, very seriously, and all our authors were always paid. I wasn't mm. talking about <laughs> No, no. I mean, but, uh, but yeah, that's what I've always sort of said to people. I'm like, yeah, research the press, but then also, if you have a way to reach out, especially with the internet now, reach out to a couple of their authors and just say, are you happy? Um, I, mean, I, I have the same experience, actually. On Predators and Editors, one of my presses, they uh, would have complaints, and it's sort of one disgruntled person who's trashy. 
But my, my piece of advice is that when you first when you first start getting things published, understand what your rights are as an author. Understand what you can demand. Make sure it's in your contract. My biggest mistake as a writer was when I uh, I got really excited. I was about 19, 20 years old, and I was getting my first chapter published. And I was so excited because there was a publisher really interested in it. I was doing spoken word at the time. And I'm like, yeah, I hear my files, publish my work. And I didn't get a proof of that book. Because I didn't know at age 19 that I should be getting a proof of that book. Whoever was working as the editor on that book introduced so many spelling and grammar errors that I then had to go and do media for and answer to their errors that weren't mine. And it was honestly the most humiliating experience of my life. So my advice to you is make sure if you're getting a book out there, even whether it's micro press, middle press, whether it's self-publishing, make sure you get proofs and you look those proofs over carefully, especially if there's other copy editors or edit editors involved. Make sure that you get some sort of sign-off on your piece of work before it goes into print and into production. And that is something that every one of you, you know, it, you don't always get that in the magazine world, but if you're putting out your own piece of fiction or your own poetry collection or anything like that, demand a final look and a final sign off before that thing goes to print because you really need to see what the publisher and editors are doing on their end and you want to be able to hold them accountable if they're introducing errors into your work. So you don't have to go and explain why you can't spell Mississippi to the first journalist who interviews you about the book. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is don't be obtuse and the story behind that is I had just gotten my first print book published, and I went to ErieCon, and um, Larry Niven, who is a delightful man, came to my table and was sort of asking about the book, and I'm chatting with him, and it's completely amicable, and it wasn't until after he left that I realized that he wanted me to give him a copy, and he was going to write something for it if I did. And I was, uh, I was obtuse, and I was also had con head. So I'll forgive myself that, but be aware that there are nice people out there who are established in the industry who won't come right out and say it, but if you get an opportunity, get your book in their hands. It's worth the expense. Uh, I'm one of these people that <laughs> I learn from my mistakes and I make a lot of mistakes and uh, so I don't really feel like uh, I'm not I was trying to think of what I could actually share as a oh my god because um, there are a few as with all anyone who's had a long career we all have things I guess my thing um, that I'll share is something I screwed up idiotically <laughs> idiotically was um a few years ago, I went to a, a reading in New York City, uh, like an erotica reading or whatever. I was in, uh, uh, and I ended up talking to some agent who wanted to represent me. We were chit chatting, but I was already being represented by another agent. And uh, then, but she really wanted to. She had this whole vision for how to do my career, and uh, which was a, you know, it's like doing with the witches and mysteries and all that. Anyways, it was so exciting. And so she told me all these books to read and then to give her some... Um, well, how it all had originally started was that I had sent a proposal about a different project, and then she, so I was on her radar. Then she met me in person. Anyways, I, I, I fucked it up because then I went through a personal problem and had a meltdown for a couple of years. So then by the time I reemerged, wrote the agent, said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm doing this now. I mean, and, and it's like, no, ship sail, too bad. She didn't even answer me. She's like so mad, probably. But actually, she probably didn't remember who I was. The thing is, if an agent shows an interest in you, you just hop on that bandwagon no matter what the hell's happening in your life because you do not get a second chance when it comes to agents. I don't really regret it because I do like my agent that I've always had. <laughs> oh, man. So we're talking about mistakes? Yeah. Yeah, I make them every day. Uh, and, and I actually don't regret the mistakes. I think that you learn from mistakes. Yeah, hundred percent. And and the mistakes are what make you who you are. Like if you aren't making mistakes, then you're probably not learning anything. And I can't think of any decision that I've made. Like a lot of I make a lot of bad decisions all the time, and there are consequences for those decisions. Free. However, the consequences of those decisions help me figure out the next step. 
uh, whether that's writing or the, my personal life or my, you know, being a teacher, like I make mistakes every day. Um, the only thing I can think about that sticks out is like, I remember being very desperate when I left university and didn't have another job. And I thought, I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to put everything into it. And it didn't work out the way I wanted to. And I feel like now that I have like a day job and a writing job, I feel like I'm not as desperate to like make money writing. I feel like the mistake might have been like that overtook the go with your guts uh, that I was trying to really put forth. And I feel like that got in the way of, of sort of hitting the ground running. Um, but even even that mistake, I recognize as like that helped me to get past the mistake and to move on. Um, I think this one comes under the, the, the heading of advice as well. Fortunately, it's a mistake I made really early. And um, let's uh, hit your specs. If someone says they want a 300 word article, don't give them a 350 word article. Um, if someone, um, in my case, puts out a call for a 3,000 word story, don't send in a 6,000 word story because you just can't bear to cut it because you will never hear from them. Um, and fortunately, I, I, I've, I've seen both sides of the table because I worked in, as an editor for quite a long time. Um, but seriously, if, if someone wants 300 words, give them 300 words. Um, even if you're 300, 400, 500 words are perfect, they only have space for 300 words. <laughs>